All right, the transition spur dream build is well underway. In fact, it's almost done. A lot of people have asked if I would make a video about building the bike, and I decided not to because I just made a video like that recently with the Niner Rip 9 where I showed the whole process of what I go through. But, you know, in hindsight, it probably would have been good. I just have building this bike up over a period of time, over the past week, little blocks at a time. However, I, in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the build. I'm going to show a little bit more in-depth of the components, how they went on the bike. I'm even going to show the tools that I use to install in case you're a bike nerd like me and you want to learn more. Maybe you don't know a lot about building bikes. So this is kind of an eclectic video, but focusing on the dream build of the Transition Spur. And honestly, I would have been done by now, except the KS seat post did not come with a lever. <laughs> I don't get it. So I looked on the website and sure enough, it says lever not included. I ordered the seat post without the lever. So the lever is going to be here tomorrow. Also, I'll show coming up in a minute the block on the rear brake. I thought it was a post mount for a 180 rotor. It's actually 160, so I got to get a riser block. But we're going to talk about all that. So I'm going to show you what goes into building this bike. So I'm going to start with the order that I go through when I build a bike. And I'll just say right off, I know I'm going to get comments about why you should not clamp a bike frame in a work stand by the top tube. But sometimes you have to. And I know what I'm doing. And I do it very, very gently because when you're running a cable through the frame, you've got to. And then this one, I had to leave the cable in the frame and I cannot put the seat post in. Uh, so that's why I have it clamped. So I know I'm going to get comments, but there you go. All right, let's start with the bottom bracket. So I contacted Transition. This is a dub bottom bracket. For those of you who don't know what a dub is, it means the axle that goes through the spindle, I should say. Uh, is 28.9 something, whereas most are 30 millimeters. So that's what a dub bottom bracket is. And so I contacted Transition. They told me to put a 7.5 millimeter spacer between the crank set and the bottom bracket. And then on the other side, it uses a three millimeter spacer in addition to this lock ring. So I always install the bottom bracket first and then the cranks. And so that's what I did there. And since I'm gonna show some tools, this is the tool that you need to tighten that bottom bracket. It is a threaded bottom bracket. You cannot use the standard Shimano tool for a threaded bottom bracket. You have to get the one for a SRAM dub bottom bracket. So that is the tool. And I will say the bottom bracket threaded in very, very easily. And for those of you who don't know, the right bottom bracket cup is a reverse thread and the left is a normal thread, but I was able to thread it all the way in by hand and then just tighten it up with the tool. And that shows that the frame is made really well. The next thing that I do is I install the headset. And so I usually start with the lower cup and I do one at a time and I press those in and I use my bearing press. And when I press those in, I don't use these adapters. I just use this because those adapters will not fit the larger 1.5 headset at the bottom. So I press in the bottom cup and then I press in the top cup and I'll just have to say the silver looks so good on this bike. I'll kind of back off a little bit and show you the whole build as it's coming together. And then I will install the fork. This fork already had the steerer tube cut since I've used it on another transition spur. So after I get the headset installed, I will install the fork with the stem. And I always try to run one spacer below and then at least two spacers above. That gives me the leeway to move the stem up or down. And of course, I like to leave a little bit at the top regardless. That way, if I use the fork on another bike with a longer head tube, it will fit. And again, it just gives me more flexibility to change up the height of the stem. After I put the stem on, then I put on the handlebars. So these are my carbon race face handlebars that I put on the bike. And then the next thing that I do is I will go ahead and put on the levers and install the brakes. And since these are new brakes, you always have to cut the lines. The lines are always too long if you get a new pair of brakes, unless you run like a triple extra large frame. <laughs> but these I had to cut and then I bleed them and I have this Shimano bleed kit. I have a SRAM and a Shimano, but this is the one for mineral oil. 
This is one made by Park. It's the BKM1. And inside this kit, you get everything you need, syringes and all that. I've got a video on how to bleach your mono brakes, and I'll link that below. As I mentioned earlier, this post mount is for a 160 rotor. And you'll see that I do not have a rotor on the bike yet. That's so I could get the SRAM Eagle set up. And I'll talk about that coming up in a minute. And so I have to get an adapter. So it, it's a, and I call it a riser block. So basically it raises up the caliper because I want to run a 180 rotor. All of my transition spurs that I've used in the past have used a 180. In fact, that's how they come from transition if you were to get a complete one. I just honestly never paid attention that there was a riser block on the back, so I needed to get that. So once the lever comes in for the seat post and that riser block, I will have this thing ready to go. So I mentioned I installed the, you know, the bottom bracket and the cranks usually first. I also put on the pedals. And then I get the wheels ready, so I install the tires first. And then I put on the cassette on the rear, and then I will put on the rotors. And I had to take the rotor back off the rear one because I, I really didn't know until I put the, <laughs> the wheel on the bike with the rotor. And I was like, oh, shoot, that won't fit. I need a riser block. So, And then I put the wheels on the bike, and then I will set up the drivetrain. So this is new to me, setting up a SRAM transmission and Someone at Transition told me, make sure you follow all the steps on the SRAM uh, you know, YouTube video. And sure enough, it was very helpful, but this is unlike any other uh, you know, drivetrain that I've set up. And you do have to follow the steps. It's really not complicated. You just got to know what to do. Uh, you know, you go on the, the website or I use the app, little SRAM Access app, which was super helpful. So this spur was not listed in the app. And so I had to put in the chain stay length. So I looked on Transitions website. I put in put in the uh, the chain stay length, the number of teeth that I use on the cassette. This is a 32. And and by the way, before I go on, I'll mention and I did not mention this when I talked about the components that I'm using for the Dream Build. I am running 170 crank arms on this. Uh, I've used 175s and gotten pedal strikes. So 170s are really good for the spur because the spur has a low bottom bracket. It's one of the reasons it handles so well, but you do get pedal strikes. And so I'm running 170 cranks. And I just got to say, man, these XO cranks in the SRAM, you know, Axis Transmission kit, it, it just looks so good. Uh, such a good looking bike. All right. So setting up the SRAM Axis. So, you know, you put in all your measurements into the calculator and then it tells you what setting there's an a and a b setting there's this little thing down here that you got to you know, set it to a or b all you do is pop that thing out it was set on b i just set it on a so i'm not going to go much into transmission setup right now but you set that uh, and then it tells you how many links you need to do in the chain i think the chain comes with 126 links and this one uh, i had to shorten it down to 116 that's the the inner plate and the outer plate that's two okay so I had to lower it by, you know, five of the inner and outer. And so then I put the chain on and then you have to set up the rear derailleur. So I pair it. Actually, I paired it to the shifter before I put the chain on. And that's so easy with this axis stuff. All you do, you just hold down that button until the light blinks. Then you hold down the button on the pod. And that's right here. Hold that down until it blinks rapidly. And you're pretty much done. You can just let the derailleur time out or you can hit the button again. I mean, that's all there is to it. You know, it's obviously a lot quicker than running a cable through the frame. And to me, that's one of the best things about Axis is how easy this setup is. And you don't have any cables running through the frame. Not that that's a big deal for me. I mean, I've got it down to a science doing it so many years. But man, so easy to set this thing up. There is no B-screw adjustment on here. There is no uh, high limit, low limit. You know, after I paired it, I put the chain on. And then you have to tighten this in a certain way. And I won't really go into it, but basically, you know, you, you leave the axle loose by a turn, leave this loose by a turn. And then you pull back on the derailleur cage, put tension on it, and then tighten it. Again, that's very different than other derailleurs that I've used. But once, you know, when you watch the video on SRAM's website, it's pretty easy to do. You, you, you just cannot skip any of the steps. I'll just leave it at that. And then I do my final bits. Now, one thing that I didn't mention is at the beginning, before I install anything, is I will put on my frame saver tape. And I don't know if you can see it in the video, but I basically put frame saver tape under the down tube. 
So I run it along. Some bikes will come with frame saver tape installed and some do not. This one did not. So I did my own and then I put the frame saver tape on and I'll make a little YouTube short about which frame saver tape that I use. I get it from Amazon, but I'll show you which one it is coming up. And then I put a little piece right here in case I were to, you know, drop a chain. I put it around the bottom bracket. Uh, but mainly this is where it's really important on a transition, at least for me, is my heels come in a little bit. So I have to put it up here and I put it down here and I do that on both sides. And then up at the top, I'll probably put a piece on the head tube if, if a cable comes near. I don't know if it will. I'm not finished setting that. I don't think it will, but the dropper post cable may come near that head tube. If it does, I'll put a piece there. And then sometimes I'll put uh, frame saver tape on the cranks. These cranks don't need it. Some of them do. And then I put a piece of frame saver tape inside the frame because oftentimes when you're putting a rear wheel on, the rotor will hit the frame and it will scratch it. And so I put a piece there. And then I put a piece under the water bottle cage in case the water bottle kind of, you know, hits the frame when it's moving around. And that's kind of, the, you know, what I go through and some of the tools that I use. You know, other tools are the cassette lock ring. The Eagle cassettes go on. They just thread on. There are no individual pieces like some of the Shimano. So it's just one big whole unit, which makes it really, really easy. Just got to be careful you don't cross thread that because uh, I actually did that several years ago with an equal cassette and that was not a fun day and you know I, I didn't mention this either but also one of the first things that I do too is I will run the cable through for the dropper post and you got to do that before you put it on the bottom bracket by the way uh, so it, and it's it's not too hard but you do have to kind of bring it out and then put it back through now someone asked me why I did not get an axis dropper post. Honestly, it's because I've never used one. Every component on this bike I have tried and tested. Even though I've not owned electronic shifting, I had, uh, I think it was XO or maybe GX axis transmission on the smuggler demo that I had in my garage for a while that I thought I was going to buy, but I couldn't sell my other bike, so I had to send it back. So I've used everything on this bike, except I've never used an axis dropper post. In hindsight, I probably would have done it. Now they are expensive, probably two to three times what I paid for this KS dropper post. But I've used the KS, I know they work well. But you know, in hindsight, yeah, I probably would have done that and I may get one eventually. And the final bits that I put on, you know, I put on the grips and then I put on the water bottle cage. I'm looking forward to getting this thing going. So let me pan out a little bit so you can see this dream build as it's coming together with my recycle bins in the background highlighting the beauty of this bike. <laughs> so that's it, it's coming together. Once it's all done, I'll do kind of a, a reveal where I just show the whole bike and um, talk a little bit more about why I went with the spur as the frame. So that's it, dream build coming together. So I hope this video was informative or helpful for you especially if you're new to building up a bicycle. That's what I go through and it's some of the tools that I use. Stay tuned to the channel. I'll be posting more videos about the dream build and of course the first ride, which is probably gonna happen a week from when I'm filming this particular video because I've gotta go out of town this weekend. <laughs> I'm ready to get on this bike if you can't tell. All right, I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks for watching.